welcome everyone uh, to this uh, uh, event. I know we were supposed to meet in person, um, but we're all trying to uh, play our role in ensuring that everyone is safe um, and basically curving, curving the curve, COVID curve steep or whatever that term is. Um, so we've decided to have this event online. Um, which also meant that uh, we could extend the invite to, to, to anyone actually who can join. So there's always pros and cons to these things, um, but we're very happy to uh, share with everyone, or welcome everyone uh, to this very exciting um, event. Uh, just an update on uh, the program. Just an update uh, on the program that we'll be starting off with Ms. Um, Ndewo from uh, FEMEF. Uh, who will be doing the official opening remarks. And Ms. Ndobo um, was the first black female actual in South Africa over the past decade and a half. She was um, cultivating experience as a risk consultant, consulting actuary, deputy CEO, and many other uh, executive roles. Uh, amongst numerous of qualification, Deboer has um, awards from Actual Women's Committee and Association for South Africa Black Actual Pro um, Professionals, amongst others. Uh, she joins us in her capacity as the CEO of the Federal Employers Mutual Assurance Company, FEM, um, founded in 1936. The company provides specialist insurance cover, cover to construction companies and their employees against injuries or illnesses contracted in the workplace. Through their foundation, FEMEF are a primary funder of the Limpopo intervention, uh, and we would not be here without the support uh, and their continued support of our work. We are glad to have you join us, uh, Ms. Ndebuo. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nangamso. Uh, and thank you also for that generous uh, introduction. Sure. So I think what I'll do is um, I'll just uh, quickly uh, go through the other speakers today, just introduce everyone um, uh, on the list very quickly. And then after Ms. Ndebo would be uh, Nwabisa Makaluza, Dr. Nwabisa Makaluza, who is our head of our Limpopo intervention. Uh, Nwabisa has been with Funda One Day for quite a while now, I think about three, three years. Uh, from heading our research to kickstarting the intervention in Limpopo. And then after Nwabisa, we'll have um, Professor Carly Addington from um, UCT, uh, who is a professor in the Southern African Labor and Development Research Unit at uh, University of Cape Town. She has expertise and experience in design, management, and microeconomics analysis of social surveys. Her research focuses on education, health, labor, labor market, and as well as household um, behavior. Um, Kelly has previously evaluated the casual impact of the Funda Wanda coaching intervention in Eastern Cape, um, and as well as many other interventions such as in Kenya, Rwanda, and all parts of Africa. And in May, 2020 this year, she produced a seminal paper on the learning losses in the early grade reading that that were due to school disruptions from the COVID lockdown regulation. The results we, we are here to celebrate have been evaluated by Kelly as well. So we're also very grateful to have Kelly to join us and share uh, all of her findings uh, on the Limpopo intervention. Followed by Kelly would be um, respondents, um, Dr. Ben Piper. Ben Piper is currently the director of the global education um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's a former senior director of Africa Education for RTI based in Nairobi. Uh, he provides support to large scale education projects across sub saharan Africa, the Middle East and Asia. And Dr. Piper was previously the chief of party of the Kenyan National Literacy Program to SOME, the set of random control trials in Kenya called the PRIMR initiative. He also led multi-country studies of highly effective large-scale education programs in collaboration with the Center for Global Development. Dr. Piper is also a member of the Funda Wanda Board of Directors, and we're very happy, Ben, that you were able to join us during your transition from RTI to the Gates Foundation. 
The second um, respondent today would be Dr. Kate Phillip. Uh, Dr. Kate Phillip is a de developmental strategist with extensive experience in development sector as a practitioner and in the policy development space, which focus on mainly on issues of economic marginalization, inequality, and in employment and enterprise development. Dr. Philip previously worked as a senior economic development um, advisor in the Government Technical Advisory Center and the Agency of South Africa's National Treasury. She is currently the program lead for the Presidential Employment Stimulus. Her presence here is appreciated as we celebrate the success of the Presidential Youth Employment in Intervention in Improving Educational um, Outcomes. And then lastly, uh, one of our respondents, is a very dear friend of mine, um, Ms. Kulula Manona, who is um, the Chief Director of uh, Foundation for Learning at the Department of Basic Education. Her portfolio includes managing uh, the implementation of the Reading Sector Plan and, the, and to lead the Read to Lead campaign aimed to mobilizing society to take part in attainment of quality outcomes in reading. She is also one of the champions for the National Reading Coalition established to mobilize uh, support across sectors and coordinate reading prom uh, promotion initiative. Uh, Kulula has been integral in fostering relationships or relations with DBE um, in pursuing of improved reading results. Her support is invaluable to our work and we're very happy to have her here too. And then lastly, closing remarks will be uh, by our um, former CEO, still getting used to that, former CEO, uh, Pro, uh, Professor Nick Spall. Um, and, and yeah, uh, Nick was the founder of, C, of Funda One Day and now is moving on to uh, do stuff at Stellenbosch, continue research in the early grade years. But I think on that note, ladies and gentlemen, with our uh, A-star uh, list, guest list today, would like to welcome you to the session. Uh, Um, and we hope that drivers, us, um, and if I may put it in that way, is to be able to not only just evaluate our work, but how we share that and uh, with the broader ecosystem um, and learn from others and feed some of our findings into the system is quite critical and centered to the work that we do. So we are very pleased um, for, you know, to be able to, 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 to share with the broader system um, ecosystem as some of our findings and we're looking forward to also engaging with everyone at the end we've got about 30 minutes for Q&A um, but in the, you may also post it up into the Q&A panel and um, the panelists are ready to sort of respond there's a whole Funda Wanda crew as well at the back that will be answering all the questions so I mean on that note I'm going to hand over to Ms. Ndewo um, who will then open for us thanks Ndewo. Uh, thank you, uh, Nangam So, and uh, good afternoon to everybody who has joined in for today's uh, webinar and discussion. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be uh, delivering, I suppose, the opening and well, uh, remarks uh, today. Um, and I'm here representing the FEM Education Foundation, uh, which is also referred to as FEMEF. Uh, as the name indicates, uh, FEMEF is a foundation that was set up by FEM, and Nangamso did uh, allude to who FEM is, but I suppose in brief, I can just say we provide workmen's compensation to the construction industry, and we are effectively owned by the construction industry. So FEMEF was established in 2016 uh, through a 750 million rand donation um, to the foundation by FEM. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that this foundation has been set up through the benevolence of the construction industry, which is something that we are very much uh, uh, proud of. Um, and I thought it's important just to give a little bit of context in terms of who we are. Uh, and our aim as a foundation is to partner with NGOs that are making a meaningful contribution in shifting education forward within South Africa. And it is for this reason that we partnered with uh, Fundawande. And our partnership has been in place since 2018. Um, and it gives us great uh, pleasure and pride uh, to be part of this incredible uh, initiative. Uh, I still recall when Fundawande first began to consult us 
on the possibility of the uh, intervention in Lipopo. Uh, at that time, there was still a relatively small organization. I, I mean, a lot has changed since then. And they were implementing their coaching intervention um, in the Eastern Cape. So that was in early 2020 when they came to us with the Limpopo intervention. Uh, and it was before the initial announcement of the uh, Basic Education Employment Initiative. Uh, and for us, what was really exciting was how ambitious they were in wanting to address the dual crisis uh, in relation to both the quality of education and education outcomes in South Africa and youth unemployment, while also adding a new province. And as FEMEF, uh, we have now co-funded the interventions in the Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and in Limpopo as well. And I think that bears testament to the belief that we have in terms of what Funda Wande uh, is doing. Um, we are always keenly interested in how our investments not only impact our partners and their immediate beneficiaries, uh, we're also interested in scalable interventions that can impact the broader education system and that have an ability to be further leveraged uh, to solve the multiple challenges that we face as, as a South African society. Um, we also seek to invest in initiatives that are evidence-based, uh, that are practical, and that are aligned with national priorities. And I think we can all agree that uh, improving the quality of education outcomes is indeed one of the biggest national imperatives that we have uh, as South Africa. Um, Fundawande is a key partner of, of FEMEFs in realizing our objectives as a foundation. And we are so excited about the results of this impact assessment because they bear testament to the fact that we made the right decision, <laughs> I suppose, in, in providing the funding that we, that we, uh, that we have provided. Uh, one of the perks of being a Fundawande partner is that um, we got to have some early insight into the results of the intervention in Lipopo and uh, the FEMEF board, I think it's about a week ago now, got to interact with both uh, Nangamso and, and Kelly, um, you know, where they managed to provide us with some insights into the um, early uh, uh, results of the uh, in, uh, monitoring of, of this um, intervention. Um, and we were quite excited about the, the outcome. Um, and uh, although as great as the results were and as excited as we were about those results, we know that the work truly begins now. Um, it is crucial that Fundawande increasingly focuses on advocacy and system level take up of the lessons learned from these intervention. And this is uh, more true given what we know, now know about learning losses that have come through as a result of COVID-19 and the pressure that the education system is under. Uh, in this regard, we are excited to see the multiple different stakeholders represented in this webinar, um, you know, both in terms of funders. I've actually got two of my colleagues that are joining uh, uh, today's webinar, civil society and government. And we hope that this is a sign of increased collaboration and alignment going forward. Um, as most of you are aware, uh, Funda Wande is going through a transition period from their founding CEO, Mix Paul, to the semi newly appointed CEO, Bing Nangamso Mtate. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure for us as FEMEF working with Nick over the past couple of years. And indeed, we'll continue to work with him because we're doing other <laughs> projects with him through uh, uh, RECEP, um, which, which are initiatives that we are also excited about. Uh, and I think if, if I have got one key message that I've taken away from the time spent with Nick is that uh, you know, the best use of private funding is to influence uh, public uh, uh, funding and public discourse where education is concerned. And we really tried to stay true to that as FEMEF. We are extremely excited about entering this new phase with Funda Wande under the leadership of Nangamso and indeed with the rest of the team and are extremely confident that the ship is being steered in the right direction and by the right person. And, and we wish Nangamso and the team all of the best. And we hope that these results that have come through from Limpopo are just the beginning of what is to come. So extremely excited to be participating in today's event and really looking forward to the discussions. Uh, thank you, Nangamso. 
Thanks, thanks, Ndobo. Um, and also thanks for the sort of vote of confidence and, and sharing some of your uh, thoughts from a funder's perspective. And like I mentioned earlier on, I think, I mean, uh, we, we are funded by FEMEF, but we also have other funders. Um, um, the endowment, the Allen and Jill uh, Philanthropy South Africa, um, Xenex, um, as well as MSDF. So it, we are very pleased to have funders on board that um, believe in our vision and mission as Funda Wanda and support the work that we're trying to do. So thanks for, for that um, great opening, the war. Now I'm gonna hand over to um, uh, Nwabisa who will just um, on a very high level share with the crowd today, the Limpopo intervention to, um, design. Um, and then after we'll hand over to Kelly. Nwabisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Madam. So, and thank you, Ndebo, for opening up for us. So, um, yeah, I think I'd like to just uh, start off with how really in coming to Limpopo, I really understood what they mean by the heartland of Southern Africa. This is the kind of saying that is carried throughout the province. And truly, in times, in some of the most difficult times, when there are rotational timetables, where there are continuous co closures in terms of, you know, the COVID pandemic, this team has really banded together in order to get the results that we have. And so for that, I'd like to first thank them. So to speak of the Limpopo intervention, I'd like to just say that one of the things that, as Ndebuwa said, is that we really, in our ambition, tried to tackle the dual crisis of unemployment as well as le learner um, outcomes. And here, the core question that we were asking ourselves is, can previously um, unemployed youth be successfully employed in improving literacy and numeracy outcomes in foundation phase? And we did that by doing an RCT, which Professor Kathy Ardington will speak towards. And this RCT was recruited amongst over 120 schools, of which 40 received the teaching assistant and our LTSM, 40 received our LTSM only, and the other 40 were control schools. But I will leave that to Professor Kathy Ardington to explain further. Our intervention is carried out through all, throughout the Capricorn district in Limpopo. So that is both Capricorn North and South. And here we targeted schools that were Sepedi language of learning and teaching in the foundation phase. They are quintal one to three schools and they are scattered across the peri-urban and urban regions of Limpopo. And this map just shows you the kind of randomization that we did in that you can see that we did not select schools of this area to become teaching assistants and this area to have materials. This was a completely random sample, which we vetted according to this criteria. Um, when we go into the teaching assistance uh, program more carefully, I think one of the big wins that we had was the recruitment. And we really did this in partnership with the Limbobo Department of Education. They were crucial with helping us with the sourcing of the TAs. But the different thing that we did in Funda one day was that we had a set of competency assessments that assessed both literacy and numeracy of people who had at least grade 12 or NQF level uh, education. We needed them to be employed at the time of recruitment and also we recruited from the community that the school served. After we had gotten those competency assessments, including their work values, we then had a selection base. And for this year, we had a total of 145 teaching assistants, where each uh, teaching assistant was matched to a teacher. And each of the teaching assistants were given two days of training in literacy and as well as two days of training in numeracy. So that's a total of four days at each term. 
Now, the reason why we did this in such thorough you know, recruitment, as well as very thorough um, training, was because our, our philosophy was that the teaching assistant should be of best assistance to the teacher. And so they should know the lesson intimately as we train the teacher so that they can best, they are best um, suited to help them. So what is the role of the teaching assistant that we gave them? We asked them to set up the classroom and to help the teacher in identifying and supporting struggling learners. We also trained them on how to revise materials uh, with learners, as well as to assist teaching with teachers with admins, such as roll call or marking. And what you find, especially even with the results, is that that extensive training that we did, as well as getting the right type of people to become teaching assistants, allowed for the results to be uh, much better in the teaching assistant arm. Our teaching assistants do not go out into the schools alone. They are they have a team of six mentors, where each mentor has an average of 25 TAs each. And the role there is to help develop the TAs in skills and behaviors. Because remember, these are very uh, young people, and so they may not have had the opportunity for professional development. They also help with the in-class observation and giving feedback to the TAs as well as helping them using the Funda Wande resources and materials. And what is critical and essential to the success of the TA program is the relationship between the teacher and the TA. And so the mentors also really helped with developing that relationship. The Funda Wande teaching assistants are trained on a structural program, a literacy and numeracy program. And so our content specialists here in Limbobo have helped us to develop these wonderful materials in which the teaching assistants gets the teacher guide. The material schools, just to note, uh, as one of the arm in the RCT, also got the full package of the materials. And the reason why we had those two arms, uh, just to recap, is that we wanted to find the effect of the Funda Wande materials and centralized trainings, as well as giving people, uh, teachers, the Funda Wande materials and centralized training, and then adding the extra helping hand, which is the TA. And that is how we should think of the results that Kari will also present. We also distributed the grade one Fula Bula anthologies uh, to, throughout all of the intervention schools. That is all AP schools. So another really good uh, intervention that we had uh, for the Educate, Department of Education in Limpopo was that we gave away five bursaries to the roads, uh, towards the roads course. And the Rhodes course is the advanced certificate in foundation phase literacy. It is the only one of its kind uh, that is offered uh, and it is housed in Rhodes University. And so in partnership with the Department uh, of Education, the Provincial Department of Education, we were able to enroll five subject advisors as well as the director of the foundation phase uh, learning. And so it was within these, this uh, bouquet of interventions that we managed to get the results. So here, I want to actually pause on this so that we can delve in deeper with the really the big meat and potatoes in terms of our learnings uh, that we got from the teaching assistant. So in addition to this rigorous recruitment, it, like, okay, so if, I, if you would ask me, what were the things that you know, were the best learnings from this teaching assistant model? I would say that it's effective recruitment and training, school and teacher preparedness, as well as acknowledging the limited time for remediation and play with the learners. But I will go through them in turn. 
So with the effective recruitment and training, this was actually done um, when we had our first uh, cohort of TAs. It actually coincided with the broader um, presidential youth employment initiative where the DBE itself had recruited TAs uh, and that was for a period of four to five months. Please correct me. Uh, and I'm sure you will, uh, Mrs. Manona, uh, at the end. But with this then, we also were doing things in parallel. And so there were very interesting learnings that we got there. The recruitment that we had resulted in 120 applications of which only 256 made it to the selection day and then 145 were selected to go into school. So quite a lot of people did not make it through the numeracy and literacy assessment. And well as then at the end of the 145 um, TAs that we got, about a third of them have a post, uh, post metric qualification. So we really did get the cream of the crop in terms of in the unemployment line. And then about 13% are currently enrolled in getting the edge degree. And what we're finding interesting is that there are more and more TAs who are actually enrolling as a result of having been in the intervention in uh, Limpopo, the Fundawande intervention. So that was the first big one, as well as the training. I think having two days each of training in literacy and numeracy in a stretch in the structural program, getting all of the TAs to thoroughly understand the content so that they can better help the teachers. They are a better help, they are in a better position to help the teachers differentiate between learners who, are, who have different um, foundational skills, as well as they are able to help the teacher along when it comes to remediation exercises in the small groups. Going into the school and teacher preparedness. So when we entered the schools, we found that schools were readily welcoming the TAs in these schools. However, because this was the first time such a structured program had entered these schools, they weren't really prepared for what to do with these uh, youth. And so they often employed them to, do, to not do the most effective functions in um, early grade learning. But this was really a problem in the beginning. I think with us continuing to go on and explain to the SMT, explain to the schools and explain to the teacher the value that the TA could have has borne out in the results that we have gotten. And also the teachers themselves has, have testified to how much more useful the Funda Wande TAs have been in their class. So again, effective recruitment and effective training make for great TAs in the class. Another thing that we was a big challenge to us was because of school closures as well as rotational timetable. And for people who don't understand what rotational timetable is, is that a class will be split into maybe two and half of the learners may attend for a portion of the week and the other half of the learners uh, attend on another portion. Now at foundation phase, when learners attend a class from Monday to say Wednesday and only get to interact with the content in the next week, chances are they have forgotten quite a lot. And so teachers, they had to struggle there with the learners who were not learning at the pace that they would have been exposed to, as well as the high curriculum demands. And so within our package in Fundawande, we have these little games that are there to help the learner grasp concepts. And so teachers would uh, say, no, this is, we don't have time for this. And what was actually great was that TAs 
faults that they could. And so this would then help with the learners as well, including through the remedial exercises. So this is basically and broadly what our response has been to the low learning outcomes that we are very familiar with in South Africa, as well as the large learning losses that have been incurred as a result to school closures and rotational timetables. And then this then effectively is what the Limpopo intervention came out to do. So thank you. Thanks, um, thanks Nambisa. Um, I think probably two, three years ago when we had uh, started to conceptualize uh, the Limpopo intervention, uh, I'm gonna admit, I mean, as, as, an, as an organization, we were like, we are now diving into the unemployment space. Uh, we are going to experiment. Uh, we are going to kind of see how things will, will, will end up. We're not, um, we're not specifically uh, an employment expert, if I may put it that sense. But I think bringing on board people like Mwabisa and Bokang, who do come from the labor market place, has, has brought a lot of insights on, on things like how, how you work with unemployed uh, youth. Um, she mentioned a point of, um, although we saw 10% of the TAs have some sort of uh, qualification, we are now seeing a lot more of them enrolling in a B.Ed. course throughout their exposure um, to the program. So I think, I mean, beyond just the, the results that we see, it's also it, it motivating or encouraging that by being in a program that we are finding that it motivates young people to, to enter the field or to be, yeah, to enter the field of education or now see themselves in future um, uh, becoming education. So thanks for sharing that. Um, and, and my sort of key take homes from your, from your presentation is relationships. It seems like it was one of the core things that you guys invest a lot of time in. Recruitment, ongoing support, um, structured programs, and so not just you drop TAs and, and cross your fingers and hope that they prosper, that there is a structured plan or structured program that they are following uh, together with the teachers um, in, in the classrooms. So on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Kelly, which I see that she's already projected her screen. Kelly is always ready to go. Uh, so Kelly, over, over to you to share with us uh, some of the, the, the midline findings of the intervention. Thank you, Kelly. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it's very heartening in these very challenging times to be able to have such um, a positive and exciting message to share and to have um, some real uh, results um, pointing us in, in the direction of uh, where we can be looking for, for effective solutions to this range of challenges that we face. So um, I'm very pleased to, to be here with all of you today. Um, so this Limpopo um, intervention and evaluation is actually uh, part of a larger learning agenda for Fundawanda, where there's actually uh, partnerships across three different provinces and then working in three different languages, there's actually a series of interventions and accompanying evaluations being rolled out over the next, um, well, this year and, and, a, and a further two years. Um, and with the, with the successes, hopefully even, even longer um, than that. So the sort of core thing, um, um, uniting all of these interventions is the set of Funda Wanda. So Funda Wanda is on the literacy side. Um, most people I think are familiar, but just in case. And then the Bala Wanda is on the numeracy, on the mathematics side. So this sort of package of learner and teacher support materials um, and some training that goes with them. But across the different provinces, there are these different, these variations in the package of support. So in the Eastern Cape, we have coaches, Western Cape subjects, advisors, and as you know, you've heard now in Limpopo, um, these teacher assistants. So I am at Saldru at the University of Cape Town, and I've been tasked with conducting an independent, independent impact evaluations of each of, in each of these provinces, but also trying to, you know, iteratively collect, connect the learnings um, both within province and across province. And so 
quite a bit of fo focus on, in general, across all of them, the primary aim of the, the, um, the evaluations is to answer the question, is, is Wonder Wonder effective in uh, reaching its goals, which are to have all children reading with meaning and all children calculating with confidence by the end of the foundation phase. Um, but then there's a, a sort of secondary aim is really to try and understand the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of all these different modalities of support. So um, coming to Limpopo, uh, one of the sort of key challenges across low and middle income countries that teachers face is large and heterogeneous classes, classes where many of the learners have fallen way behind the curriculum. Um, and in other contexts, uh, including Ghana and India, uh, policymakers have attempted to use either a teacher assistants or youth volunteers um, to, to help teachers with classroom management and provide sort of additional small group and one-on-one -on -one support. Um, so in the South African context, and then in Limpopo even more so, um, Huge class sizes are, are very prevalent with over 40% of learners in classes of more than 45 learners. This is obviously pre-rotational pre timetabling due to COVID. And we have an enormous unemployment problem with the burden predominantly felt amongst youth. Um, so 76% unemployment rate. Another way of thinking in South Africa at large, one in three 15 to 24 year olds is a meet. They are doing that, not in, in education, they're not employment. They're not in training. Um, and so the, the question as, um, you know, has, has already been, been uh, um, pointed out that this Limpopa intervention is really focusing on, is it, is it possible to recruit, train, mentor and support unemployed matriculants within a structured program such as Wonder Wonder with these learning and teaching support materials to improve early literacy and numeracy outcomes. Um, and, you know, indeed, this, um, this, this program, um, as Nubisa said, is running alongside at the same time that um, the DBA and the presidency introduced the, the Presidential Youth Initiative. And, you know, the panelists from the presidency and DBE will, will I'm sure, um, you know, pick up on this. Um, so, the relevance of, of um, answering this question um, is extremely, extremely high in our current context. So already, this has all been already, already done, but um, so basically we recruited 120 schools and then randomized them into three groups. And then the one group got just the materials arm and then the other, the teacher assistants, follow them over time, go in and measure the same learners longitudinally, follow them at various points in time. And because we randomized, we know that the three groups were very similar before the intervention came along so that any differences we see once the intervention is rolled out, we know we can attribute to Funda Wanda. So, um, and the reason we have sort of two arms is that we can, the importance of the teacher assistance to the overall impact we can really um, isolate that and tease that out. Because if we only just had the teacher assistance, we'd only know that this sort of combined package works and we wouldn't really be able to measure um, what the teacher assistants were, were adding. Um, so firstly, the context. COVID continues to have a devastating impact on schooling. Uh, this, these pie charts are showing, the first one on the left here is from term one and two. Yeah, you can see the light blue, only 10% of schools had daily attendance. Everybody else was rotating. By term three, now remember in the middle of the year, successful vaccination drive, particularly in Limpopo province of teachers, directed from DBE to go back. Term three, we still have less than half of the schools um, are back full time. And other research, some of it using Funda Wanda data from Eastern Cape has really documented that these schooling losses translate into massive learning losses. Um, so looking at our learners that we assessed in grade one, so in term three of grade one, just looking at one um, measure, at the percentage of learners who could not read one word, and in control schools, that's sitting at 80%. So this is a simple word. The first word that they were shown to read was Bala. 80% of learners cannot read this word. 
We don't have in exactly the same schools a comparison point pre-pandemic, but if we look across a bunch of other studies, the first one actually is in Limpopo in Sepedi, but in various other studies conducted by DBE, um, Funda One in the Eastern Cape, these are the percentage of learners who, who could not read um, one word at the end of grade one. And 80% is a shockingly high um, number. So um, we're seeing, really seeing the impact of COVID here. So if we then look at the materials only arm, those are in green, we see that it looks pretty similar, also pretty shocking. In the arm with the teacher assistance, which we're calling the LTSM plus TA arm, we see that there is a huge improvement. Um, although we're still far off um, where the curriculum um, requires us to be, and learners in TA schools are 13 percentage points more likely to be able to read at least one word than learners in, in control schools. And not only are they more likely to be able to at least read, amongst those that are actually reading, they're reading faster. So as an example, at the 90th percentile, they're reading at 22 words a minute in those TA schools, whereas in the control schools at the 90th percentile, they're only reading at nine words a minute. Picking out just one math, maths item, um, this is a similar idea, percentage of learners who cannot do at least one subtraction sum. So the first subtraction sum, very simple, four minus one, 47% could not do this. Again, pretty similar percentage in the materials only arm, but when we get to the TAs, we see a big improvement. They're 10 percentage points more likely to be able to do um, one sum. So I, those are just two, two examples. Um, what I'm now gonna show is We've taken all the various tasks, the foundational reading skills tasks that we include in an early grade reading assessment, and we're expressing them in standard deviations. Um, I know that's not a nice way to interpret. It's not like how many learners can read a word, but the nice thing if we do that is we can compare the tasks across each other, across tasks, and we can compare across studies. And so what we see here, if we do that, that this is this over here is the materials only arm. We don't see any effect here at the red line, horizontal line at zero saying no effect. Here we see that across all of these different foundational reading skills, we're seeing that the TA arm is outperforming. And this is our composite measure where we pull all of these together and we're getting an effect size of 0.44 standard deviations. So what does that mean? Um, how does that compare? So what I'm showing here is two recent um, meta-analyses of looking at literacy interventions across a range of low and middle income countries. One on the, the left is from 2020, the one on the right from 2018. And I'm going to now um, click my mouse and you're gonna see where um, the 0.44 standard deviations that we're observing in Limpopo fits within that. So we can see that it is on the large side of effects for both, in terms of both of these uh, meta-analyses. If we come closer to home and look at other South African reading studies that have been rigorously evaluated, we've got DBE's um, early grade reading study, um, which found an improvements of 0.14 standard deviations in the first year. And Fundawanda's own uh, Eastern Cape coaching intervention found improvements of 0.19 standard deviations. So if we move on to looking at um, mathematics, we had a range of assessments here because we were worried um, about flow effects, especially with COVID. So we had one-on-one -on -one very sort of early numeracy um, uh, assessment. And we see here, we're seeing significant impact on these sort of procedural tasks. So this is like counting aloud, um, concrete countering, ordering numbers, and so on. We don't see sort of anything going on with the more sort of conceptual stuff like um, short, um, sorting, um, pattern completion, et cetera. Um, however, it must be said that these, these sort of first three tasks, the counting large number order, concrete counting, dominate the CAPS curriculum. And although teachers, we did ask them, they're very unlikely to say that they're skipping material in order to catch up due to COVID. But um, we do wonder if perhaps across all the classes, these sort of smaller parts of the curriculum um, are being left out. 
And then we turn towards a group administered early grade maths assessment. And here we're seeing across the sort of the quantity comparison, the simplest task, we don't see a significant difference, but across all of the others, we're seeing um, significant differences. And so just going back into the sort of standard deviation effect size space, we're talking about effect size on the composite thing of 0.22 for um, early numeracy and for the EGMA of 0.38. So in the South African space, there's no um, similar studies like DVD studies, and uh, there are some smaller studies that uh, suggest effects, but they haven't been rigorously evaluated. And the whole numeracy space, there aren't these review studies. Um, you know, it's sort of a little bit behind um, the literacy space. But one of Ben Piper's studies, I think, is is um, an interesting point of comparison. So this is a, it's a very effective study. Uh, in, in Kenya um, with both grade ones and twos. So the kind of effect sizes we're seeing in the Kenyan study are very similar to the kind of effect sizes that we are seeing here in Limpopo in this first year with Fundawanda. So we might be interested, so what I've been showing you up till now is an average effect size. This is on average how much better the learners in the schools with the Fundawanda trained teacher assistants are doing than learners in control schools. But one might be interested in saying, well, is, it, is the impact the same for all children in the class? And actually, you might be interested in specifically of the rank of learners in the class. Is it that the TAs are helping the weakest learners with some sort of remedial stuff? Or is it perhaps, if you think on the reading side, sort of more advanced tasks, the group guided reading that TA assistants might help, maybe they're having a greater impact on learners who rank higher in the class. So what these are showing is looking for just the effect of being in the TA arm by the rank that the learner has in the classroom. And just to sort of summarize, what we're seeing is that the effects are largest for the higher ranking learners on the literacy side. But on the early numeracy side, it's, they seem to be highest from about the 15th to the 45th um, percentile of ranking within the class. And with the EGMA stuff, we're seeing smaller effects at the very bottom of the class, but pretty consistent effects throughout, where, depending on where you rank um, in your class. So in summary on the findings, we're finding that the provision of the Fundawanda teacher assistance to these grade one classrooms has been highly effective in improving foundational um, reading and mathematics outcomes. So we, we're very aware that learners are not are performing way below curriculum expectations still, but these effect sizes are substantive and are impressive when you compare them to other rigorously evaluated programs in South Africa and, and elsewhere. And this is particularly remarkable given what we know of rotational timetabling and the exposure that learners, or the limited exposure that learners would have had to this, this timetabling. So what I'm going to now do for, I've kind of told you the highlights, the conclusion, and now I'm going to share with you um, bits of the data to try and unpack where these um, results might be coming from. So the first thing I'm going to show you is something from the teacher reports. So what we're really looking at here is, well, what, what uptake was there of the program and sort of how much fidelity was there? Was there a lot of variability? Um, Etc. So, so here we see teacher reports on how often they say they use various Fundawanda and Balo. So at the top here we've got the Balawanda teacher guide, and over here we've got the Fundawanda teacher guide. The dark green on both sides is showing that they report using it every day. And essentially, what we're seeing as patterns here is teachers report using the materials very frequently. Not so much um, the training videos, but we know that these. A lot of these were not in Cepedi and were subtitled. So this is something for Fundawanda to consider going forward, whether they want to create Cepedi versions of, of these videos. The anthologies, even though they only used about a third of the time every day, they are still used very frequently. They use more than most, by most teachers are reporting using them more than once um, per week. So we see, um, very high teacher reports, but the one, so that clearly here there's desirability bias. Um, 
So what we did in each school is we randomly selected two grade one learners and we did an audit of all of the DBE rainbow workbooks and the Funda Wanda and Bala Wanda workbooks counting every single page, whether it was partially or fully completed or blank and also whether it had been marked. And what we find is actually pretty low average usage of the workbooks. Um, and we find this, so here is showing across, if we look at the top, we've got DBE home language term one and two, and then DBE mathematics term one and two. So here we've got control, materials only, and the TA arm. And we're seeing this light blue is less than 25% of the book being filled. And then the dark blue is between 25 and 50%. So we're seeing, that on average, about 40% of these workbooks have been filled. And it's pretty similar across all of the arms. When we turn to Balawanda and Pundawanda, we see that pretty, pretty low usage as a percentage of the whole workbook filled in. All of this unsurprising, given that we know that children are coming to school every second or possibly every third day. One thing to bear in mind, particularly with interpreting this Pundawanda, the, the learner activity booklet all the stories are integrated in there. So these, this is the percentage of exercise pages where the learner could write something. We can't know whether the stories were being used. So, let, so just, we just need to be aware that this is a lower bound on how much those labs were used because if the teachers were actively using the stories, we don't have a record of that. Um, what this is showing is individually by school across those two, the average across those two learners, this is a, just an example for home language. So the light blue is showing how many pages in total in the DBE rainbow workbooks had been completed. And then the dark blue is showing in the Funda Wonder Lab. And I think a couple of things. Firstly, it's very clear that the Funda Wonder and Bala Wonder Labs are being used as a complement and not a substitute for the DBE workbooks. The DBE workbook is, looks, the distribution looks pretty similar across the three arms. Um, so therefore, we have substantially more work being done in terms of how many pages learners have filled in, in both the materials only and the TA arm. But we see enormous variation in each arm with some schools, and if we focus on like treatment schools, where very little work um, has been done. And we see this, so this is, a, this is a challenge in terms of getting much more greater uptake and uniformity of uptake. Um, for Funda Wanda going forward. So this is the literacy, but the maths patterns are very, very similar. So clearly we're not seeing big differences between the materials only arm and the TA arm in how much of the workbooks were used. So that can't really be driving the results that we see. So we now turn to look a little bit more to try and see um, what we can from our data in terms of what might be driving the impacts. This is showing for um, un unprompted teacher reports of what they say the role of the TA was in assisting them um, with. So for the non-TA arm, these are people referring to having had a, one of the DBE educator assistants in their classroom. Um, there's only about 24 teachers in this arm. So a lot of them didn't report it that there wasn't an educator assistant assigned to the grade one classes. But I mostly want to focus on what did they say that the Funda Wanda TAs were doing. And you can see marking is mentioned, unprompted by 90% of teachers, monitoring learners. But also we see some other things. We see um, working in small groups, um, very, very um, common mention, and 80% talking about helping the teacher with um, remedial activities. So if we look at the workbooks, although similar average percent of the workbooks have been filled in. This is showing the percent of the pages that had been filled in that were marked. And what we see is a higher percentage um, were marked in the TA schools. And this corresponds with that unprompted, that's one of the key things that TAs help with. We asked teachers about reported the, the frequency of various activities, including various reading activities. And what we see in the TA arm is that group guided reading in particular was more was reported to occur more frequently. Teachers in the TA arm also said that they group learners according to reading ability more. And as um, 
you know, they 70% of them talked about helping work, the TAs assisted with working in small groups. So it seems to be um, that might be one of the drivers of the results. And then from the numeracy activities, one of the things that stood out is that teachers reported that assessment was done more frequently. Actually, with over half the teachers saying there was sort of daily um, assessment happening. Um, and that was happening much more in the TA arm. So that, again, might be pointing to um, one of the ways in which um, the learner experience in the classroom is changed by having um, the TAs there. A teacher rating of the TAs, both in terms of their skills and their helpfulness, um, was very, very positive. Here we've got 87% of teachers saying that the Fundawanda TA was very helpful. Um, no one saying they were not helpful. And you can see, you know, uh, teaching assist educator assistants also po positively received in the non-TA schools, but much less so um, than those that were rigorously selected and trained and supported um, by Funda Wanda. So um, next steps. So we will be looking towards um, really trying to get um, into the monitoring data to understand, and particularly with the challenges of COVID, we know that the intervention played out quite differently um, in some schools. So we really want to sort of tease that out. And with the um, Ursula Hoadley from the University of Cape Town and Hansa Wettenert from uh, WITS are leading um, a qualitative component of the study doing in-depth case studies um, at schools in across actually all three of the provinces. And so we are really looking forward to their findings, which should be forthcoming soon. Both looking for um, bigger clues about the potential mechanisms driving these initial results that we're seeing, and also what life they can shed about the sort of notable variability that we're seeing in uptake and fidelity and what lessons from the one they can take forward in terms of um, dealing with that. From the quantitative evaluation point of view, we will be going back to learners in a year's time or in term three of 2022. Um, hopefully, um, hope springs eternal. Uh, learner attendance will approve and with that, there will be greater exposure to the program. So we're very interested to see. We didn't see any effects on the materials on, but with greater attendance, maybe there will be effects there. An interesting reflection on the, on the, the sort of rationale for the program, a lot of it is around um, pulling in teacher assistance to assist with these enormous class sizes. So 2021 has been a bit of a funny experience in the fact that with rotational timetabling, the classes are not so large. And it's sort of a really interesting thing to think through what might happen when the learners do all come back. Because on the one hand, it's possible that teacher assistants might find it overwhelming to be in these classes of 45 to 60 learners and, and find it more challenging to achieve effects. But equally, or on the other hand, um, the benefit of having a teacher assistant in the classroom you know, is, is quite likely even, even more advantageous when you've got, you know, 45 plus learners um, in the class. So it's going to be very interesting to see how things play out um, over the next year um, of the program. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, I think, I mean, I think one of the things that we are very obsessed about um, at Funda Wande is uh, evaluating and independently evaluating our work. We truly do believe that this keeps us honest um, internally, uh, and we, we use these results not only to feed into the border system, but also it helps guide us in terms of all these last questions that Kelly was bringing up, like, large school classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But we use it to really inform the direction that we are, we are going. We believe that the work that we do is experimenting and figuring out models that can be taken up by the system. Um, so, you know, for us, com committed, committed or being committed to ongoing evaluation is very, very, very critical. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ben Piper, 
who will be the first respondent uh, to uh, the, the intervention and the results uh, that was shared. Over to you, Ben. Thanks so much. And hi, everybody. Greetings from Nairobi, uh, just to your north. I'm so excited to be here. Congratulations both to Kali. That's a really well done study um, with a lot of the sort of things that most of these external evaluations miss, understanding the mechanisms at play. So I have some comments on that in a bit, but I want to thank you for that. But also to the Fundo One Day team, um, congratulations on having uh, meaningful impacts. And in fact, I have you know five five comments, and that's the first one, is just to say that it's worth noting, as Kali said, that these are meaningful impacts on learning. The 0.44 standard deviations, 0.38 standard deviations are substantial and large from an international perspective uh, on learning outcomes. And I, actually, I did a paper a couple of years ago on kind of the magnitude of impacts. And this study, if it had been available, would have been included. Um, and Dave Evans recently did an analysis of effect sizes in the education sector. <clears throat> and according to her, his methods, um, you're talking somewhere in the 80th to 90th percentile of, of, of effects for international education programs from what we're seeing here in, in Fundo One Day's um, TA program. And as Kali said, also the you know, there are other studies that have similar effect sizes. You mentioned the primer ones here in Kenya, the math results. And I think the comment I'd like to say about those is that those results from primer that were achieved in kind of a similar uh, medium scale intervention actually then got scaled up nationally. And just want to be have the people on the call thinking about the implications of this, these results for Bala one day and the numeracy side. In primer in Kenya, these results that had very similar effect sizes the next step was to make them nationally implemented in, in, in 22,000 uh, primary schools across the country using government and uh, GPE funds. Um, and so what are the implications for us? If we're actually talking about some of the largest impacts on numeracy, uh, these sort of interventions, what should we do? It, and the question really is, it, is there urgency for change based on these results? And if not, why not? <laughs> So that's the first comment, meaningful results on learning. Second one is just to really push on this issue of, of the mechanism for change. What's the mechanism for the improvement? I know that's coming from the study uh, that we're waiting on, but it's really useful, I think, as somebody who's, who loves the quantitative side of it, but also sometimes the qualitative is needed to understand and kind of explicate what's actually happening. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of the Fundo One Day and Bala One Day materials. But it looks like from this evidence that it's not the utilization of those materials alone, at least in this kind of 2021 uh, weird year, because there actually wasn't much difference in workbook use. There wasn't a lot of difference in teacher's guide utilization. There wasn't a much difference in kind of the, um, the anthology work. Um, so maybe it's these sort of things that Kali mentioned are kind of differences in the two approaches in that very interesting bar graph you showed that the, the, this time spent on remediation was higher in the TA's arm. The time spent where the TA actually was teaching had a difference. Uh, the use of small groups uh, was, was different between these groups and the use of, of math assessments. Now, if you think about kind of how that actually would play out in a classroom, these sound like potentially relatively small changes in daily pedagogical practice, but kind of the key point I wanna say is that maybe those small changes can actually have meaningful impacts on, on learning, that there's something happening with a little bit better teaching, combining the teacher and this TA, that it can have a, reason, a, a meaningful impact on learning outcomes. Another way, another potential mechanism I'd love to see what the qualitative results say, is it might be that the combination of the, the, the utilization of the Funda Wandi materials, plus these additional TA activities, kind of creates a multiplication factor. We're not seeing a fundamentally different amount of time spent using the workbooks, but maybe the combination of workbooks with a little bit more grading gets the student, uh, the learner, a little bit more feedback on their performance, and that combination might result in better outcomes. But I really think as, as researchers, as people interested in education in South Africa, understanding the mechanism for change from this particular study is really important because what, if we're thinking about scale up or we're thinking about the implications for Funda Wanda implementation going forward and for Limpopo as a, as a province going forward, understanding what that mechanism is is, is really nothing more important. So I, I'm, a, I'm a discussant um, respondent, so I get to push a bit. So I want to push my colleagues at Funda one day. I'm on the board there, but I, I want you to hear me on this. What is it that we need to do to redouble our efforts 
to increase the utilization of the workbooks and the teacher's guide. Obviously, 2020 was weird. The, the rotational timetable really disastrous with respect to um, classroom and, and instructional time. But what are the things that are in the control of Funda Wande, or probably more importantly, in control uh, in, in the control of Limpopo that could actually improve uh, the utilization of the materials? We had some other data from internal Funda Wande results that actually showed that, that the utilization looks a little bit lower at Limpopo, Limpopo even within these two treatment groups. What can be done to push on that. And as somebody who has had previously <laughs> the experience of supervising and supporting large scale imp implementation programs, the kind of design of your supervision, monitoring, and feedback structures so you're understanding where implementation is low and pu quickly pushing to increase it and finding ways to partner with your, your government counterparts to get the message out really is, I would say, from an implementation point of view, uh, most important. So the third one, the third comment I make is just the, the, the power of this study to think about uh, how to utilize these teaching assistants effectively. Uh, these youth volunteers being a presidential initiative uh, and actually showing impact. I don't think we should move too quickly to kind of ignore that. That's a big deal. There, there was a very similar program in Kenya that ended maybe three years ago from the, the deputy president here that didn't show any impacts on learning <laughs> at all. Uh, and there was a really harsh interaction between these teaching assistants and the teachers and a kind of some pushback by the teachers unions. So what is it that happened well here in Limpopo that actually not only got this relationship between the teachers and teaching assistants to go well, but also to improve learning because that doesn't always happen. Um, and I wonder if some of it is about this kind of the support structure that Funda Wandi was providing that made the impacts from this uh, these, these teaching assistants to be more effective in this treatment group than others, because that, the, that structure really makes a difference and I think might have some uh, benefits to, to, to going forward. There are several countries that are thinking about these kind of youth employment schemes that are connected to education and very few of them have this, these sort of results. So I do think there's some lessons learned that kind of the support, mentorship, feedback and utilization that those six officers were giving to all these 125 or 145 teaching assistants, that's a pretty affordable ratio. If I understood correctly, you just have six mentors supporting all of these teaching assistants. That might be something that even beyond Funda One Day that the broader South African government can think about. It's not just getting these teaching assistants, youth employment, you know, youth into the schools, but having enough support so that that can be an effective implementation I'm quite interested in. So youth employment schemes exist several places, several countries, and I'm really excited to think about how we can learn from this experience to make the implementation of this beyond just this program uh, more effective. And again, because I'm a uh, I'm a, a respondent who doesn't live in South Africa. I do have some pushes a bit for, for the government counterparts that are not just the government officers themselves, but also those who are supporting them. It really is clear that from these evidence, this evidence that it is possible in South Africa to improve foundational literacy and numeracy at the same time. There's so many studies that are kind of either literacy or numeracy, very few that are combined. But I wonder if there are ways that we can see these results as kind of a push for us to get that not only the kind of the provincial level or national level buy-in and focus, but really at the on the ground, the kind of the mechanism that the officers on the ground inside of the government structures, the provincial level can say that this is not only a program that we're allowing in Limpopo, but a program we are prioritizing. It's relatively easy, easy in quotes, to kind of get the buy-in and the ceremonies and the MOUs and the signing. But the hard part is to kind of get the system of prioritization of the individual civil servant that is deciding whether or not to get the message down to this teacher that this is something that we care about. And I think that that system of prioritization, another study that I, I was leading, showed that that kind of government level implementation of what matters and what you should do when you're beyond the kind of training time when you're in the daily daily decisions of how to spend your time. Prioritizing these things that work, I think might be something that would, would make a bigger difference. And I actually ask a question as a non-South African, the, Kylie mentioned that it isn't that the Funda Wande materials are pushing out or crowding out time for the DBE workbooks. There are other countries where it actually is a relationship between the program and the government that those new materials that are science-based and evidence-based become government materials 
And so instead of trying to balance, a teacher trying to balance two different sets of materials, it is a message from national or provincial government that we're asking you to use these teacher's guides, to use these workbooks on, the, on a daily basis. So why are we not considering allowing these materials to be the DB materials and see not only if they can work well together, but if these ones implemented on a daily basis, consistently in kind of a structured way that kind of builds on the progression of skills in SEPEDI um, might have an impact that is beyond that. So for me, I really would love to see in my ideal world, not only what we've seen so far, which is the TAs can work, but what does it look like when the TAs are being effectively implementing the support as well as having the daily instruction in the classroom, the normal teaching of the materials being more effective. My last comment, there really just seems to be nothing more important than to respond rapidly to this evidence. Learning loss is crushing us across Sub-Saharan Africa. So to have evidence of what can work in the face of learning loss and the face of rotational timetables, there really just doesn't seem to be anything more important than to find our ways, whether we're in civil society or implementer or a government officer to respond rapidly. And not only to, 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 to make Funda Wande work well in Limpopo, but also to think about what are they doing well? What is a system doing well that can be built on in other contexts and other programs and not just in lower primary, but throughout the education system. So I'm really, Honored to be here and thanks so much for the, the chance to talk about this study. Congratulations, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, every time when I, uh, I hear you take about, uh, talk about uh, take up and utilization reminds me of that very first conversation we had two years ago when Funda Wande was, uh, had started with the workbook uh, development. Um, and I think you, you you bring forward very good and thought provoking points um, also for us internally um, that we're seeing these results, but when, as you would have seen in Kelly's uh, um, sort of report in terms of page usages or whatever the case is, and I think this is where the qualitative work will will Will, will help us understand the why. So now we know the what through, through Kelly uh, and sort of Ursula's work will help us be able to understand those, those mechanisms, change mechanisms as you referred to well. Um, also another thing we've been seriously um, looking at in terms of our, our framework and how do we approach these sort of shifting things at intervention level, but how do we apply that at a much more scale or a much more bigger scale? I know it's, it's one model that actually, from, from RTI that basically looks at, you know, the will, the government leadership, the design, the curriculum, the materials, teacher training, teacher support, data systems and system management. So we are now increasingly uh, are, are looking at this problem in multiple direction. It's not just materials or just TAs and, and so on. So I think you, 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 you have pushed us indeed uh, and helped us sort of uh, try to, you know, push ourselves and think deeper and further um, about um, all of the stuff that we are seeing on the ground and how does that look like on a broader scale. So thanks Ben for that. Um, the second respondent is Dr. Kate Phillip. Um, over to you, Kate. Thank you. And thanks for such a fascinating presentation of, of, of results. And really, um, I'm so struck by the synchronicity. <laughs> Um, and the fact that, you know, um, you were already on the ground and evaluating at a point where the employment stimulus was uh, having to respond to the crisis situation. Um, but what I envy is, is that you were able to uh, do this with real thoughtfulness and planning and build the evaluation in from the start. Um, I'm afraid our process was a lot less uh, uh, deliberative than that in the sense that we had six weeks to design the stimulus and then six weeks to roll out 320,000 school assistants once it was announced. And there's no doubt that in a process like that, some of the wheels can come off. Um, in fact, not a lot of wheels did come off, although certainly there's a lot of room for learning and improvement. And I just, in every slide that was presented, what is so clear is the importance of the learnings from this process for building uh, a good process in terms of the national rollout um, that continues to happen. So phase one had a range of uh, challenges, but also achievements. Um, we are really excited 
that the, it has been possible to have a phase two because when the stimulus was first launched, the message was very clear that there would only be one phase. Um, this was a once-off. It was in the end five months. We're well aware of the limitations of that. But um, as I often say to people, you, you play the hand of cards you dealt. And the hand of cards that we and DBE were dealt was either you do this in these five months or you don't do it. And then you don't do it at all. <laughs> um, and so for all the limitations of a five month exercise, what has been really exciting is how the enthusiasm for the teacher's assistance program was sufficient to secure a phase two. And we are now working really hard at lobbying to institutionalize the program for a longer placement period and as uh, a program with medium term funding, which will um, certainly um, uh, uh, create new opportunities for, for, for impact. But I think that this research is really timeless in terms of um, feeding into that process and ensuring that the terms on which such a program is institutionalized actually take into account uh, the lessons here. If I can, I've just got three slides. If I can just quickly share. Um, so we are now in phase two of the stimulus. So in, and I'm showing this slide because I love this photograph and it is a teacher's assistant. And for me, it just captures the energy that I see in your photos, but also, you know, where this works well, it works brilliantly well. Um, and the importance of getting that message out, how important this program can be for learning outcomes, as well as for employment. Um, but both, of course, matter. And for us, the big risk was always, might this do damage in the schools? You know, we couldn't be sure. And, and the biggest fear was that actually rolling out this program so quickly and at such scale could even damage outcomes in the short term, um, which was all we had at the time, was short term. So just very briefly for those on the call who, who are not familiar, as part of the Presidential Employment Stimulus, um, 320,000 young people were employed at 22,000 schools. Uh, one of the most exciting features of this, from my perspective, is the spatial equity. There are just no employment programs that reach every corner of the country at speed. And this one does and has done and can continue to do so. I think Ben raised some interesting questions about buy-in from teachers unions and the importance of process. And for all the hostile timeframes we were dealing with, we really did try to learn from uh, other experiences. Uh, and part of that learning was the importance that the locus of decision-making and control needs to be at the level of the school. So that it is the schools that select the teacher's assistants. And although um, in phase two, there's a lot of emphasis on improving the selection process. Uh, in phase one, graduates were prioritized for the teacher's assistants and everybody had to have a matric if they were going to support in the classroom. Um, there was a strong emphasis on training to support curriculum outcomes. Um, and and again, hostile timeframes placed limits on this, but it is definitely a very strong element that I'm sure DBE will speak to. And I'm quite sure that Funda Wande has enormous value to add in terms of the learnings from this program. Again, the feedback from teachers, uh, we did not have the benefits of, of, of your depth of evaluation, but certainly from survey information, there has been strong support for the program from teachers, which is a big factor in securing its continuation from all stakeholders within the schools. Um, and really this slide is only here to show the photos because they just, they just say so much about the energy that teachers assistants can bring into the learning space. Um, so we are in phase two, it, the target this time is 287,000, they are mostly already in post. And I think some of the questions linked to Funda Wanda is how best to feed the lessons from Funda Wanda into this process so that we really institutionalize this, this program on terms that are beneficial. And I think in the way, really the timing couldn't be better from our perspective for these learnings to have come out in this um, very uh, uh, you know, uh, effective um, evaluation uh, framework. Um, and so what are the critical lessons that we should take from this to, 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 to do better? Because we want to maximize the curriculum outcomes as well as the meaningfulness of the work for participants. 
One of the key things is the role of mentors. Um, we didn't have mentors for the school assistants. The teachers and school staff and principals were the mentors. How do we take lessons from your experience to institutionalize the function of mentorship and build the capacity of teachers um, and other school staff to, to, to perform that function? Um, yes, I, I mean, I, I, I also the, the question of how one takes the supplementary learning materials to greater scale, what lessons one can take um, from, from, from that, how critical. Uh, I mean, the one thing the study doesn't do is look at teachers' assist assistance without supplementary learning materials. Um, and it seems to me that that's a really important dimension, actually, um, and that we need to look at how, you know, what, what combination of, of inputs is, is optimal. Um, and, you know, we are typically working in suboptimal conditions. So when you are working in suboptimal conditions, what minimum intervention can add the most, the most value? Um, so these are all critical questions that I think arise uh, uh, from the work. But the bottom line is that, um, you know, this work couldn't be more timeless from, from a policy perspective. Uh, it has the potential to really help augment the case for institutionalizing um, a teacher's assistance program. And I think many of the ingredients of strengthening such a program um, arise from some of the evaluation outcomes. So congratulations to the team and really just to express strong appreciation for the fact that you were ahead of the game here uh, and you had not only a program, but also an evaluation in process uh, for results to come out um, so timelessly for the wider debate in this space. Uh, so thank you and back to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Kate, uh, for for your thoughts um, on that. I mean, one of also uh, one of our sort of values to say we always see ourselves as the people that burn our fingers first before government does. So here's a great example. So we have burnt our fingers. We have had to, you know, sort of figure out the things and and also, I mean, in, in particular, coming into this. Our new phase of Funa One Day, a very big theme of ours is to also for, to, to do responsible advocacy, right? Things that we know that works um, instead of, you know, advocating for things that you're like, oh, we're not sure. But here is a good example of one, us probably being ahead of time could be beneficial to the program. Um, you know, we've burnt our fingers and now we've got pieces of this groove case that we so chatted about all these various of things that were inputs of the intervention that know that we know now and have evidence that it works. Um, so we we are looking forward to 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 continue to work uh, with the presidential youth stimulus team and to continue to share our findings and you know really uh, we see this as a collective issue if I may put it in that sense. Um, but also now we'll hand over to Ms. Kuluda Manona, which I know that we've been working closely with her team in the Reading Champs, another example of, uh, of some of these small mechanism changes um, um, has been incorporated in various of ways, small ways um, within the broader sort of initiative. So Kulula, uh, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nangam So, and uh, thank you to the Funda and the team for putting together this webinar. Very interesting what all the speakers have said. So I, I want to appreciate the, 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 the program itself that Funda One Day implemented, uh, but also appreciate um, your bravery, which you, 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 you actually attested to that you want to test the innovations uh, that you, you, you put up and just how rigorous this um, uh, study has been. It's, it's, it's very useful for us. Um, so, so, so Kate uh, just alluded to the work of government, which is similar in more ways to, 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 to the work that you did. Uh, but I think what sets you as a part is that you had uh, to then implement that very rigorous um, external evaluation to be able to come up with a concrete evidence of whether this works or it doesn't work. And, and we're very happy because it affirms our own conviction uh, that uh, interventions of this nature do work. And, and the timing is also quite apt 
it could not have been more better because we are currently looking as government at, at various innovations, but really to be, it, it, it really is something that we want to do to look at those that have already been tested as we are all battling um, the effects of COVID. Uh, we know that even prior to COVID, we still had issues uh, regarding um, outcomes, particularly um, learning outcomes and, and, and reading outcomes and, and numeracy and mathematics outcomes, particularly for, for, for learners in the lower grades. I'm also happy that uh, this study has actually been implemented in grade one learners. Uh, we know actually where we stand when it comes to grade one learners in, in, in terms of the deficits uh, that they come to schools um, already um, exhibiting uh, that just thinking about the general household survey, uh, which looked at access to early years, uh, particularly for children aged zero to five, uh, who come from, 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 from low income um, households, uh, that we have about 2.2 um, million of those learners who have not had access to any early learning um, opportunities. And so, so, so the age cohort that you came in and just did that study in to show um, what would work if we were to consider the various contexts of our country, including um, the fiscal constraint context of this country. And I think what this also does is to um, is a reconceptualization. I'm, I'm calling it a reconceptualization because teacher assistance is a concept. It's not something new. Uh, but to be able to think about it at the scale at which we are implementing it and, and, and also to be able to put on the table these very convincing results. Uh, actually, it drives us to rethink what we um, uh, have in our heads or the idea we have in our heads as what should uh, constitute a teaching and learning workforce. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm calling it a workforce because we know I've just spoken about the fiscal constraints that we cannot afford as the country at this point in time uh, to have an extra pair of hands for a teacher uh, in the form of a fully employed, uh, trained uh, um, a, a teacher assistant or, 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 or or, or any kind of a, a, a support that would come in that fashion. You know that you, I think Nwabisa alluded uh, to, 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 to one of the programs that we have tested, and I think you are integrally involved in uh, looking um, uh, at, at whether as, as the teacher, we can be able to, to, to support other kind of mentoring and coaching uh, programs uh, for our schools. And it all boils down to one thing that it, it's very expensive for the country to be able uh, to, to sustain. So to be able to think of an additional workforce that can come in and, and, and really support the teachers. And I spoke about our own conviction as, as government in terms of what we were thinking it would bring um, the, the required results. Uh, Kate just uh, spoke about the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program uh, that we implemented. And, and I think we coincided with that implementation with uh, uh, the Impunda One Day implementation of the Teacher Assistance Program. And, and and so I'm going to give this as a disclaimer, as, 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 as much as we did not do any rigorous study, which is why we're very grateful to you that you have done this study. We were very aware of the fact that we needed to put some results on the table as well uh, to be able to even knock on the doors of presidents and the doors of, of national treasury for any kind of continuity to do that, we coupled ours uh, with a very intensive uh, uh, monitoring and quality assurance process. So it's in no ways a, a, a rigorous study uh, like what you have just shared with us. But I do think that there are a lot of similarities that I can draw from your program and what we did that actually has helped us uh, to be able to reshape and, and, and remodel and repurpose our program as we are now currently implementing uh, phase two. So I was very ambitious with uh, what I thought I could be able to share about the reading program, a uh, reading champions program, but I know I'm just going to be really doing a touch and go on some of the few slides that I want to share to just illustrate my point. So to answer the question, the question is in the affirmative. Yes, I do think that I want to support um, uh, the sessions and the findings of the study that teacher assistants do work. And, and I think we have seen them work. So if I can just quickly share with you um, 
um, let me just try and put this on slideshow. Do my slides show? Yes, they do. Thanks, Kuluna. Beautiful. So what I want to quickly do here is to look at, um, um, without even going through this slide, to look at what we thought were the success conditions uh, that we needed to think through. And I think this actually, uh, we're converging with what Nwabisa presented. Uh, so firstly, I do want to acknowledge uh, the, the, the work and, and the collaboration uh, that we, we had with a number of civil society organizations, we would not have been able to establish the kind of impact that we did. But we also established that uh, what we needed to do was that provinces needed to have their own capacity to be able to drive this program. And together with uh, the, 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 the kind of networks that we were able to mobilize from our already existing uh, uh, relationships, including Funda one day we're able to provide together with provinces and drive that, 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 that program. So the other success condition is the availability of suitable and age appropriate reading resources. And, and I think that's what you were able to, to, to provide as part of this program um, uh, uh, where you supplied to LTSM and in some schools, of course, LTSM uh, coupled with a teacher assistant. The welcoming environment in schools, and I think it's something that is very common and the community within which these teacher assistants in our case are reading champions had to work and their support as well as the resources that needed to be provided uh, to, the, to, the, to the reading champions in our case. Uh, so just to step back a bit, the reading champions are part of that 320,000 odd that Kate uh, um, just referred to. So what we did as a Department of Basic Education was to look at that number and divide it into five categories. So 23,000 of those um, were channeled to be reading champions. So when we're talking about the support, we're talking about ensuring that they do receive training, they do receive um, uh, training resources, they had data, and they, that they should have been mentored. And again, um, and, uh, um, I was happy to, 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 to listen to Kate, um, perhaps uh, being very honest about some of the shortcomings. Uh, so one of those shortcomings was that we could not be um, able to provide a very intensive mentorship program. We relied uh, on, on, on a few uh, reading coordinators and, and a few, and, and, and just a very lean capacity in provinces to be able to supply and provide that kind of Mentorship, as well as the teachers who themselves were very busy trying to chase up after um, the, the trunk, already truncated uh, in, uh, teaching plans. Uh, so, so, so that was not really a, a very successful uh, a, a part of the program. And also to have the correct quality and quantity of candidates sourced uh, to be part of these reading champions. Again, given the time constraints that we had, uh, this was one of those that we find ourselves, found ourselves having to work with what we had. So um, I've, I've spoken about the training manual. So this very intensive monitoring and quality assurance program that we, we, we did, uh, we, we, we tracked it, uh, the implementation of the program over a period of four months, uh, but up Pattern after a period of four weeks. And you may recall that even the school started very late last year because I think COVID was quite rampaging and everything had to be pushed back the time they had in the classroom was quite limited. But what we did, uh, given the lemons that we had, was to decide on the kind of the flavor of the lemonade that we had to make. So if we were to do an intensive quality assurance, what is it that we wanted to do? We decided on the tangibles. Is there a drop all and reach a period in the class, in the school? Um, are there any resources in the school? Are there spaces that they could convert into, into, into libraries? How many corner libraries did they implement uh, during their presence in the schools and uh, what is it that we were doing uh, in terms of preparing learners and, and just introducing the culture of reading and the enjoyment and the fun component of reading in working with their teachers. How were they going to ensure that parents became more involved uh, in the reading development of their children? Things like having a reading log card, ensuring that it is signed by the parent and that children were given books and children were given opportunities to initiate reading themselves. And we also 
also very interested to know at the context of the school, whether they were following a rotational a timetable, and this is what that slide talks to. And so we saw that within the three weeks that we were doing this intensive tracking, that there was an increase quite exponentially um, in, 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 in the number of schools that were utilizing very effectively the drop all and read uh, period. We also saw that the number of reading corners uh, that were being established by the young people was also increasing. So I see your face, Nangam, so I think you are indicating that I am going to be running out of time very soon. Uh, so yes, just to talk about that reading log, uh, we saw that the numbers of the parents who and now um, being uh, uh, integrally involved uh, by ensuring that they sign the reading logs of their children was also increasing. I can share this information with you, uh, uh, colleagues. But again, uh, what um, 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 uh, um, uh, I think the previous speakers touched on is the importance of ensuring that the teachers brought into the program themselves. And many, many of them uh, were, were, were also um, a part of those that were surveyed and they gave us very positive results about what it is that uh, these young people were able to do uh, when it came to, 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 to supporting them in the classrooms and um, uh, reading initiated by learners themselves and just a gallery of, of, of the happy learners and what these reading champions were able to do uh, in the schools. Uh, and we also had asked them a few questions about their own journey, and many of them were able to tell us what it meant for them. Uh, Kate spoke here about uh, testimonies that came from schools, and here is one of the schools uh, that gave us its own testimony, saying that we want this program to come back. But I think what I wanted to talk to is again the importance of that mentorship. And here, Funda Wanda has come in uh, very handy to support us uh, by integrating technology to provide that and close that gap of mentorship, which we are not able to close with the first phase. So this time around, we are implementing courtesy of you and I'm so in your team, uh, in a, 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 a component that is going to be leveraging on technology to be able to provide a mentor in the pocket. So yes, uh, there's a video there, but so what I wanted to say to you is that without any doubts, a program of this nature as well, and as government, it has helped us to ensure that we can draw on initiatives of this nature to ensure that we are able uh, to, to, to provide meaningful one um, engagement of young people in our country, but while also uh, doing what we need to do, particularly in education, uh, which is to ensure that we shift the learning outcomes positively. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kalula. I mean, I, I just switch on my camera. Sorry to rush you off uh, at the end there. We, you actually have a, you actually you have about, yes. yeah, you still you still have a bit of um one or two minutes left. But I think um before we take on the Q and A's, um also to say that um we've been working as Kalula said, have been working closely with her and her team, um to feed in some of those learnings. Um, and seeing some of the stuff that we've learned that have worked sort of been taken up by various of ways but i think kulula if you could um for while i mean while we while i'll give people an opportunity to post their questions uh one minute that video um uh that reading bot video i think it may be it may be interesting uh for the attendees to also see so i'm going to put you on the spot again to ask you to go back to that that slide and actually play that video uh it's while very interesting yeah, while well, people um, post um, their questions on the Q and A, and as well as the Q and A, and then we will we will sort of yeah take questions shortly. So I think it was further down. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's refusing to go in, on slideshow now. All right, yeah, there it is. I will be able to locate it very soon. Yes, it was on talking about phase two. Yes. And in the meantime, I want to welcome people to post their questions. Um, we're going to be going into the Q&A uh, session. So I do want to encourage attendees to, 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 to post questions or to even um, raise their hands.
it does it does seem like there's a there's a bit of a sound issue Kalula, which is which is which is fine if the sound is not what we will do is um we will just probably then share with a link to the video on the chat chat box would that be okay maybe there's a a buffering thing or something that's happening on, okay, on your it's side. not coming on clearly on your side yeah, yeah it's not which is fine. We will then what we'll do is we'll just share it with everyone on the call. But I thought it would be uh, it's a it's an interesting Brilliant. yeah it's an interesting tool that we co-created with DBE um, in their sort of implementation. So I think yeah thanks Kulula a lot for that. Um, and I will just skim through. I see that we only have two questions on the Q and A. I spotted one other question in the chat box um, and. Yeah, so I'm encouraging people to come through with questions, but um, Elizabeth Henning is asking um, here one of her questions, and probably this is more for the Funda Wanda team, uh, Rabisa, is how come the workbooks are not being used more? Home language of Funda Wanda. Funda Wanda is used as a complement, um, not unexpected. So I think probably her question is along the lines of, uh, how come the, our workbooks, our workbook, is not used more than the DBE workbook? Do you want to answer that? Uh, okay, no answer. Um, I think the main problem here is that teachers are really afraid of, you know, kind of prioritizing the Funda One Day workbooks over the DBE workbooks. And this is despite the numerous occasions where the Limpopo Department of Education has come to show their endorsement that you know, the Funda One Day workbooks and Funda One Day is working in partnership with the Limpopo Department of Education. So this is where Ben's uh, kind of pressing us is going to be very instrumental next year in figuring out that beyond speaking with the Department of Education, getting teachers to kind of let go, because even with the DBE workbooks, it took some time for the teachers to really uh, take on the workbooks properly. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Nabisa. Um, Kulun, I'm going to ask you just to stop sharing your screen because we can still see your presentation on your other end. And also just to add on Nabisa's point um, is that uh, when we did our own internal uh, monitoring uh, and evaluation, we also had found that um, in Limpopo, the teachers do make photocopies um, of the actual workbook itself. Um, for the of uh, like Nabis has mentioned, so and when we sort of probe the teachers to understand, you know, you get a workbook every term. I mean, there's no need for you to be trying to, you know, make use of the resources, you know, efficiently rather than you know making photocopies. And the biggest thing that came out was that teachers were afraid of giving the kids the books to take home, to use it at home, and uh, to draw on it or to damage it or the dog, you know, ate it or whatever the case is. And one of our things, at least from uh, some of the research that actually Nick and, 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 and Kelly did in the, in the Eastern Cape and KZN, that um, having resources that kids can take home, um, you know, and, inter and interact with it, not just only in the classroom, um, increases, increases the time that kids are exposed to reading materials and so on and so forth. So, I mean, yeah, so it was very interesting to see that our internal or Kelly's, Kelly's results showing um, not that much utilization, and then also our internal uh, monitoring, when we went and counted the pages, it was also, you know, not that much being used. Uh, so, but I mean, that probably provides the explanation is that they, they make photocopies. Um, although we are working on encouraging teachers to, you know, give the books to the kids, let them take home, let them use it, draw on it, color in it, and, and, and so forth. Kelly, I see your hand, and I, and I think, do you want to add on to that response? Yeah, I just wanted to just re-put up um, that graph of showing, just, if, just look in the control schools. I really think with rotational timetabling and the year that we've just had, that it really is, I mean, there's clearly work to be done by Funda Wanda because there's massive variation within each arm and there's some teachers who are doing quite a lot and then others who are doing nothing. But I really think 
it's almost too early to say, um, you know, in, in a situation where, and in some of these Limpopo schools, the rotation wasn't like a day on day or week on week off. It was actually like a th kids were coming a third of the time because the classes are so large that to adhere to the one and a half meter rule, et cetera, you actually have to split the class into three. So, um, yeah, I think, I think utilization is disappointingly low, but, but we, really, we really don't know what it would look like um, if kids were coming to school every day. Um, what we do know is in a situation where kids aren't coming to school every day, there's a lot of variability of what teachers are doing. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. And seeing that you have your camera on, keep it on because there's one more question for you <laughs> um, from Payne. He's asking, are you tracking the same learners in 2022 and in 2023 or tracking year on year learning performance improvement within the same grade? Our plan is to longitudinally follow the same learners at the time. So we've done that in the Eastern Cape for Fundawanda, but also for the evaluation for USAID of story powered schools in case in Eastern Cape, we also longitudinally follow the learners and EGRS, um, DBE studies follows them. And while there is some attrition, there's a huge advantage to actually following the same learners over time. So yeah, that's what we'll be doing. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Kelly. So in other words, Kelly says to you, Payne, that uh, you must just hold on tight. Um, there will be sort of um, more data that will come will be coming out of the of the study in the future years. Um, Lauren, and I think this one is for you, Nwabisa. Um, Lauren is saying, given how TAs were actually used, please can you elaborate on how much content knowledge TAs needed that's in maths or and literacy? Would you change training of the TAs or we, we might where or where there may be more emphasis needed and how often do they receive training? Okay, so just to start off with the last question, uh, the TAs, they receive uh, training for four days, uh, once a term at the beginning, well, usually during the school holidays. And what we, I would, we have done uh, to improve things is that we now have a teacher assistance manual in which the teaching assistants are orientated according to, you know, the behavioral management of being in class. The Bala one day principles, this is before they even enter the class, as well as the Funda one day principles. So, for example, in maths, uh, there's a lot more uh, emphasis quite earlier on, on the scaffolding levels, which the mentors gave us feedback that they wished that we had trained the TAs much earlier on that um, than we had in this uh, current year. And then as well with the language uh, literacy, we have more structured uh, in terms of the language lessons, as well as, you know, a bit of the life skills. But in terms of the literacy and the numeracy, we train them as in everything that we have trained the teachers on, because we really believe that the TAs should be able to follow on from what the teacher has done. So although they don't enter with a lot of content knowledge, through those very intensive trainings, they get to adapt and quickly you know, learn the skills that you need. Thanks. Thanks, Nomisa. I uh, hope that answers your question, Lauren. Payne, I do see that your hand is still up, so I'm not sure if that's an old hand or, or a new hand. Um, but I'm just going to read a couple of comments as they're coming in um, for, for everyone on the call. Ben is suggesting or he's saying you could consider a heavy messaging campaign from Limpopo lower level officers to reinforce Fundawanda or Balawanda materials utilization with uh, circuit, uh, circulars, SMSs, WhatsApp maybe. He also suggests and do a positive reinforcement for teachers who are using the workbooks consistently in the public. So I think that's a, that's a good, good suggestion there, Ben. Um, Raymond, uh, who's also, who is the, the project manager um, in the intervention, he's saying we are also introducing the WhatsApp bot, which allows TA to real time 
on content and videos interaction. Okay, Payne, you're saying it's a new hand. Do you want to come in and ask your question? Uh, yes, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can, Payne, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to find out, especially around the um, recruitment criteria. I, I, I think we, we both agree that the experience and the training that the teacher assistant would have received is quite crucial and critical, you know. Um, and I'm just wondering, at the end of this program, we might lose that kind of experience if these training uh, teacher assistants are not like uh, pursuing an education qualification or uh, do not have any education uh, qualification. I'm just wondering, did you consider maybe people that are pursuing an educational qualification or that do have an education qualification? If so, what were the challenges maybe in, in, in making that as part of the, the the recruitment criteria, uh, 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 bearing in mind or just um, you know thinking about retaining the, the skills, the training, and uh, the experience in the long run. Thanks, thanks, Ben. I think good question. So obviously, I mean, I can see you have your video on. You're ready to you're ready to answer that one. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, the interesting thing is that um, of the people who had already, who were qualified and doing the ed, our attrition was mainly from uh, people finishing their B ed, doing their practicals and being absorbed into the education system. And so although we do not have an explicit searching just for people who have done B ed, the fact that it is within education and we do all of the competency assessments means that we really get a really good bunch of people who are actually um, studying the B ed and get absorbed into the system. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Mavis. And I also want to add, because um, we are currently now recruiting, um, also in the Eastern Cape, I'll chat to that shortly as we close off. Um, so. Uh, we're also seeing quite a large, uh, I think in, East, in the Eastern Cape cohort, about 30% of the TAs that we are now currently in training, they are doing their training now as in today for the rest of the week, 30% um, of them have some university degree. So, they, they, I mean, for me, this speaks to probably one, the sort of the high unemployment rate, um, that there are many people there with qualifications that um, you know, obviously unemployed, and I'm um, hoping that also the second part maybe not so dif difficult to to prove, but I think probably our selection not difficult to prove, but we know this. But our selection process, so they undertake, like Mabisa mentioned earlier on, a very rigorous selection and recruitment process to really try to identify those that one have you know that show great potential, and two those that. Um, also show potential to be sort of absorbed by the education system. So, yeah, I think now we had a very good point. Um, and I'm just going to quickly see if there's no other questions in the Q&A Q &A chat. There's nothing. Um, Lauren, uh, the slides and the, and the, and the um, session would be, will be put on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. So, do keep a look out um, by end of day tomorrow. So on that note, then I'm gonna hand over to Professor Nick Spall to do our closing remarks um, of today's uh, session. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Nangam, sir. <clears throat> and thanks everyone for joining us uh, for these exciting results, uh, the launch of, of the Limpopo evaluation. Uh, maybe just to start uh, with <clears throat> a few thanks. The first big thanks is to the Limpopo team. Uh, many of whom are in attendance here. I can see going through the names of the attendees. Um, Nobisa, every time that I ever say, you know, congratulations to Nobisa on this amazing uh, results, the first thing she will say is, you know, this is the result of hard work from a very large team of people. Uh, and I just want to sort of congratulate that full team of people uh, that is very large. We would can't name them all now, uh, but all of their names and faces are on the website under the Limpopo team. Uh, so huge congratulations to that big team of people 
uh, that have really done something that would be remarkable even in normal times, but doubly so in a pandemic uh, when undergoing personal strains and difficulties, uh, rotational timetables. So just a, a really big round of applause. If we were there, we'd all stand up and give you a big round of applause uh, for that big team of yours. Uh, and I know that you guys, uh, um, uh, that this is a very proud moment for you as well, that your efforts and the effort that you guys have put in, and it was a lot of effort, uh, is really showing really impressive results. Um, the second um, thank you is also to the people that are in government that are working with us on this project. Um, I think that this is something that's really exciting in South Africa is that there is this interface between the research community and the people in the DBE and in presidency. Um, and as much as we started this ball rolling, not knowing that COVID was coming, not knowing that TAs were going to get employed, it was actually looking forward and saying, we thought that the politics and research internationally, as well as the on the ground realities in the classroom, were a bit of a trifecta that were pointing to a sign, a big sign to say that youth unemployment is going nowhere, really, in terms of it will still be a problem even in 10 years time. And literacy and numeracy is also a problem that's going to be with us for a very long time. And here is an example of an intervention that can tackle both of these critical issues in South Africa at the same time. And I think that the only remark that I want to make here is that I think we are in this as a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, and that as much as what this uh, evaluation is showing is that TAs can work, not necessarily that they do work in all situations and circumstances, but that when they are recruited properly, when they are selected and trained and supported and mentored, that they can have a big impact uh, on the literacy and numeracy outcomes of the learners that they are supporting and help the teachers that they are working with. I think that the, the full report that's listed that we put the link to in the website um, provides a lot of detail on this. Uh, I think I've, Nwabisa in, in another forum earlier mentioned that only 44% of the applicants actually passed the numeracy and literacy tests, uh, even though everyone had a matric. So it's not clear that just by kind of only getting a matric qualification as the qualifier of becoming a TA is good enough to get the caliber of TAs that are, we have in Limpopo. But I think what it does show is that it's possible. Uh, and I think that is something that is really an encouraging thing as, as one of the a community of people in South Africa that are doing research on numeracy and literacy in South Africa, that it gives us heart and a lot of encouragement that this is possible. It is actually possible to move the needle in both literacy and maths uh, with an intervention, intervention trialed in one of the most challenging contexts. Limpopo has one of the largest class sizes on average of all of the provinces. Uh, it's one of the least resourced provinces uh, that we have in South Africa. And yet, even in that context, it is possible to improve numeracy and literacy outcomes with the right support. Uh, so I think that's maybe the best way for us to go forward here is to say, you know, how can we shift the presidential employment stimulus from being five months to being much longer, whether that's eight months or a year, because the impact of the TAs that you employ for a full year in Fundawande in Limpopo are likely to be different to a very short period of five months, particularly if it's over the holidays in December and January. We don't think that those TAs would likely have the same impact as a sustained uh, period over a longer period of time. And I take uh, both Kate and Kulula's point that we need to start thinking about a teaching and learning workforce as opposed to just a teacher force. And also how can we augment the case for institutionalizing this by government? Uh, and I think that the, the various different presentations that were made today, um, we're looking at all of those, I'm very encouraged that this is, uh, there's a sort of a sense of possibility that we really can do something with these results and this research, and that we found something that hopefully will be useful, not only for us in Fundawande, uh, and not only to the team that's taking Fundawande forward, um, but also to government, both to presidency and to the DBE. Uh, so thanks Mabisa and, and thanks Nangamsa. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nick, uh, for those closing remarks. And, and also just to add on that as my sort of closing remarks, I think we, we're doing very well on, on, on time this, this, this afternoon. Um, so I think from the Fundo Monday perspective, uh, or sort of next steps from this, um, is uh, we are uh, extending uh, the Limpopo intervention. The original plans, this was pre-COVID now, as Nick has said, this was 20. 
2018, I think, 2018, uh, when the team was starting to be put together, is that uh, ideally, we had, not ideally, originally, we were going to be there for only two years in two grades. Um, but because of um, these positive um, results um, and also COVID learning losses, um, we're going to be extending it into an additional year, so an additional grade in, in, in 2023. And um, through uh, a lot of the work that Kelly has done through the learning losses report, um, uh, which some of that data was collected in our schools in Eastern Cape, uh, we do really think there is something special uh, or something, the combination of a TA and a structured program and recru recruited correctly, properly and ongoing support is a very good mix of a cocktail. Um, so we're seeing these TAs um, as sort of our catch up into bridging the learning losses. So we see and we understand that if we don't address the learning losses as an organization and probably uh, more urgently as, as a broader uh, system, um, for us at Funda One Day, we are not going to be able to reach our 2030 goal. So for us, sort of playing a catch up using TAs, um, and now we're deploying them in or recruiting at TAs as well as in Eastern Cape um, over the next two period as to seeing as the bridge for us to be able to meet our 2030 goal. I think probably one last thing I want to close on, um, particularly, I mean, seeing that we've got this, uh, this uh, platform is the issue around ongoing timetabling, rotational timetables. So you saw Kelly presented on the number of days and attendance. Um, we work in both Eastern Cape, additionally, Eastern Cape and Western Cape, and we really have a lot of schools uh, that are, are reporting to to, to do ongoing uh, 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 rotational timetable, even into the new year, although it is mandatory that um, set by DBE that you know, kids must return to school um, at 100% capacity. So this for us moving forward is really something that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously means less time, um, learning losses as, as we know, but really something that we think it's, it's very critical to be addressed. Um, that the more kids, you know, attend a quarter of a week or half of a week, um, the more of these sort of losses we, were going, we are going to continue to experience. So on our side as Fundawane is to say, um, we think that there's a good cocktail mix here. Um, we think that if recruited correctly, trained correctly, that TAs may be uh, a possible solution into bridging the learning losses. And I think as a sector, really, it's probably high time now that we don't continue as business as usual because it's not. Um, it's almost like a double catch up. Like Kululia has mentioned earlier on is that there was always a sort of big gap between um, or sort of a bi-model education system. And I think what COVID has done is just only to exacerbate um, the learning losses pre-COVID. So on that note, I just want to also thank um, all the speakers uh, today that joined us uh, and uh, all the prep that they did, reading the report and reflecting uh, and really giving us some food for thought moving forward. Like Nick said, I mean, this is, this is a marathon. Um, it's not a sprint. And I think the team internally, uh, I mean, we, we internally has also reflected on some of the preliminary findings and, and what does this mean for our interventions moving forward. We see ourselves very agile. Uh, one of our focus areas is, you know, remaining to be responsive uh, and, um, yeah, and reflective. So I think a lot of these discussions or this discussion in this um, webinar, I think as a team, we're definitely going to be taking forward. And I think most importantly to Kulula and Kate is that we are, we are very um, excited um, into working uh, with the various of government um, departments and seeing ways of how we can, you know, feed in some of our learnings into the system. So on that note, thank you very much, everyone, um, for joining us. I know it's supposed to be an in-person, but Continue to be safe, um, wear your mask, sanitize all the COVID protocols. Yeah, so on that note, thanks everyone for joining us.